Hello, Nishan Joshi. How goes it with you? Hey, John. Thanks for having me. It's no problem, no problem at all. I've got the heaviest question ever to ask you. Um, we're going to talk about your politics and let's just get into it. Um, you lead quite a few roles. What have you discovered at the intersection of being an underground musician and being an NHS worker? Well, it's it's been good because it's been, uh, I've been able to use my, my music as a sort of extension of, of my own day-to-day life and my own day-to-day -day work as well and that during my during my work as a doctor I'm obviously trying to do my my very best for the patients but I mean you see the results of lots of social inequalities on a day-to-day -day basis as a doctor and I don't think you can really ignore the fact that a lot of these outcomes are are because of of the the decisions of politicians and I think to ignore that is is just really sort of sort of fastuous and and uh, it's almost negligent really to dissociate yourself from politics with I mean just because we're not taught it in medical school um doesn't mean that it's not not relevant you know and particularly in the last few years I mean when we look at I mean you don't have to look further than 150 odd thousand deaths during the pandemic and the choices that were made at the time of, of March 2020 the other day I was having a look at one of the threads that I did, which I think was from 10th of March 2020. And I took people through a walkthrough and looking back on it, it was a, such an accurate play by play of what was going to happen and what needed to happen for us to, to avoid complete catastrophe. At a time when people was, were, were still going to gigs and everything and people were 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 carrying on as normal and Boris Johnson was saying I shook hands with everybody in the hospital I mean I wrote everything down in about a 30 point thread saying this is what we need to do right now and so I was a frontline doctor in A&E back then and it just really sickens me to know that even though I, I was a canary in the coal mine and saying guys I mean all my friends around me knew they listened to me they stopped going to pubs. They stopped going to gigs around then. They listened to me. My mum and my dad, I made sure they stayed at home and didn't go out for anything. And uh, I made sure my, my family were, were wearing masks around that time as well. So it was just stunning to know that there's just an incredible amount of gaslighting going on right now and revision of history, um, a failure to apologise as well. Uh, people talk about lessons learned, politicians talking about lessons learned. Uh, really, it, it's just there's no humility, there's no acknowledgement. And I, I think it's so sad that all of these 150,000 people have just become statistics as well. Um, I recognise and I've experienced the grief that families have experienced as well. Um, it's just absolutely beyond anything. I mean, I'm thinking about the patients who died by themselves in hospital without their family members being able to come and visit them because the family members themselves were struck down with coronavirus. Um, those patients died alone and their families will have to live with that for the rest of their lives. So it's not just a simple, you, you, you've you gotten, it's a, it's, it's a series of tragedies. And I don't think anybody's really grappled with that, saying that the, the wave of grief which is enveloped a huge amount of our country over the past 18 months is just it's just beyond extraordinary i think it's going to lead to a to to a, to a lot of distress in uh for for a lot of people for a very very long time sadly sure i have so many questions for you and i want to ask a few of them now rather than waiting until the written interview to come out but there is this um, opportunity that you have to see things from, as I said, an NHS worker, a doctor, and also someone who's in the band. We are approaching winter, um, if not at the very edge of it. What are your thoughts regarding um, this period of time and what it means for COVID from the perspective of both of your different you know, uh, experiences or livelihoods? I didn't catch all of that. You said what it, what it means for for you in terms of your perspective being from two different uh, livelihoods, that intersection, I think you're in a very unique place to comment on what should or shouldn't be done 
regarding this time? I think what needs to be done is that we find a time machine and we go back in time about 10 or 15 years and we train up a lot more doctors and a lot more nurses. And sadly, I, I think the reality is that there are just too many patients who are too unwell um, and require a lot of time from uh, doctors and nurses and the volume of those patients who require the most time has increased dramatically over the past few years. Um, it's just, there is too much demand and not enough supply. Uh, there's literally not enough space in hospital for, for, in, uh, on a lot of occasions. Um, you see lots of hospitals going on what they call black alert. Some hospitals diverting away patients from A&E saying that ambulances can't even go there because there's not enough space, even if they make it there. Seeing queues of, of, of 10, 15 ambulances at a time outside A&E waiting for a space while the patients they picked up having to wait in an ambulance outside A&E. Now, whether you call us a, a first world country or more economically developed country or whatever, um, it's not acceptable. It's really not acceptable. Um, I've, I've been to, to lots of different countries to experience the taste of hospital life and medical life there. And uh, I never thought I would experience this in this country um, in, in my lifetime, certainly. Uh, it's, it's really quite it's upsetting because everything could have been avoided. Everything could be avoided and we could still have a plan saying, okay, you know what, next few years are going to be terrible, but in five years time, it's going to be recoverable. We might get back to a vague sense of normality where if you need hospital help, then you will be seen within four hours in A&E and <laughs> not a case of now 75% of people are, are meeting that four hour target, which is the worst it's been in, in years and years. I think it might be the worst it's ever been. Um, so it, it's, it's just un unsustainable absolutely unsustainable sure um i can't help but feel that um what i'm concerned with not coming just from a certain uh, malaise or sense of anxiety returning to gigs but just the reality um is there anything that gig goers can do or promoters can do to make what could be an issue less of an issue i do believe the bulk of the majority of of the situation should be adjusted by the government um but now that we're in the position of going back to gigs would there be anything that you could actually say could be done differently or better well i think the main thing that we discovered over the past year and again this is something we warned the government about a very long time ago and completely completely ignored it until just recently which is really one of the most outrageous bits of the, the pandemic i wrote an article about a year ago for Byline Times, if, if you search on Byline Times and, and my name, um, they'll come, come up with an article about the importance of ventilation during the pandemic. And I wrote in there that we're really missing a trick with ventilation now that we, by that, by that stage, I mean, to start off with March 2020, everybody thought that you just need to wash your hands and keep washing your hands and that you'll be okay. Really, within it was within weeks, it became very, very obvious saying, actually, you you're not getting this from from poor hand hygiene yeah this yeah. thing isn't traveling on on planes and ships because <laughs> to different countries at a, at a ridiculous rate it didn't get didn't get from china to america because people aboard a plane didn't wash their hands it was because they were sharing the same air and that concept took months and months and months well sadly it's around 18 months now yeah for the government to actually recognize because they don't want to accept responsibility for those initial mistakes that they made. And that's what I've been recommending to gig promoters. A lot of people have come to me for, for advice over the past few months, which I, I'm, I'm, I was very humbled by. Um, and my advice has been to try and focus on ventilation. Now, obviously you've got the issue of noise pollution, for example, so you can't just open windows in, in a gig venue because it, it, it's, it's not fair on, on anybody nearby. Um, so the, the recommendation that I've been making is to, to try and invest. And it's not cheap, but I think the, the best thing you can do is, is buy a, a HEPA filter, which will clean the air to a reasonable extent and at least mitigate some of, of issues and, and trying to emphasize that if you're getting a rebuild or, or 
um, or trying to expand your gig venue at some point, which a lot of places are, then at least have one eye on ventilation as, as well. Smart ventilation and, yeah. and carbon dioxide monitors. This sort of thing gives you a property of how potentially infectious like a place is likely to be. And just practical things as well. And you don't go to gigs to 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 wear a mask, to, to be fair. I don't think it's unreasonable to expect gig goers to, to wear a mask at all times. I, I, I think it, it's, it's I, mean, I mean, I'm a doctor, but also I can say it's just not much fun in a sweater environment. It's not very much fun. Um, and it's, it's quite uncomfortable if you're in a sweaty place as well. So I, I think um, just from a practical point of view, wear a mask if and when you can, for example, if you go into the, to the bathrooms, which we know aren't going to be ventilated really, um, that's a sort of small sensible message, um, uh, uh, measure that you can take. And obviously wear, wearing your mask on pub, public transport on the way to, to getting there. I think wearing a mask is just a good idea um, for the foreseeable future anyway, when you're in enclosed places on public transport or, or, or with people outside your, your family group. I just think it's a good idea um, because, I mean, if it saves you a bout of the cold or the flu, let alone COVID, I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty okay. Um, and um, obviously encourage everybody to get vaccinated. So I, I think that's, once you've done that, I think given the government's policy and abdication of responsibility, I think you're, you're, you're doing all you can really. Yeah, yeah, thank you for answering these questions. It would be ideologically remiss if we didn't follow um, the, the tracts that are basically laid out before us, um, given your um, your actual position. Um, that ventilator, or not ventilator, um, filter that you talked about? Yeah, the HEP, HEPA filter, HEPA filter. Yeah. Um, how much does that cost, do you know? You can, you, you, you can buy it from killtheicon.com. <laughs> <laughs> there's the business opportunity there like we've got the branding in place like you know <laughs> oh mate I, I missed the boat on that because the, the truth is that i i knew whatever happened with that is that the the government's friends were always going to get those contracts um so I, I was very much at peace with that once i knew the inner workings of the procurement industry so um, yeah, I mean, those HEPA filters can cost from a few hundred pounds to a few thousand pounds, depends how big your, your gig venue is and how how diligent you want to be. But uh, hopefully at some point, maybe sort of a culture fund or something like that might um, end, end up subsidizing those in, in venues. That's what yeah. I would hope. That yeah. would seem something really sensible and saying, for example, the government will cover some of the, the, the cost and yeah, you um, took the question right out of my mind there. I mean, I'm hoping that's what's going to happen. Um, my inner cynicism is saying, no, <laughs> that you're in I the mean, UK and they've never really truly understood the benefit of like an act until it gets to a certain level yeah. in the O2 arena. So why would they want to help a grassroots venue? So, you know. I mean, I, to be fair, I mean, we, we have had sort of subsidies which have, have encouraged buying solar panels at, at cut price costs and, and that sort of thing. Um, and that was really, really successful. Um, so it, the precedent is certainly there. Um, and I think that especially this winter, it, it, it might be a win-win sort of thing, especially if you can, if the venues can advertise that they've, they've got these measures in place. I think it would certainly be... Um, would encourage more people to go out in a place where they felt was 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 safe particularly now that for example the idea of vaccine passports seems to be being scrapped um so that you don't have that sort of mandatory um mandatory law coming in you know so i, I think now that they've scrapped that idea um whether it was right or wrong i think this is this is the only only other sort of sane option really Sure, sure. I, I wasn't sure about starting off with this particular um, insight that I now have, but it seems to be part of that first question. Um, in 2020, many strange things happened uh, in your life, which involved Channel 4, Vogue magazine, and a lot of coverage. For those who don't know about any of this, can you give us a brief, if possible, approximation as to what happened to you? Well, I, I was one of the first doctors who, who actually raised the raised concerns about our um, our trajectory in the pandemic, and 
I was working in A and E, seeing coronavirus patients, and at the at the end of January 2020, it seemed a little bit of a joke. Really, it just seemed like oh, there's a bit of a virus from China. Oh, we're going to, we were having a, everybody was having a giggle about it. There's not one one doctor who just underplayed the risk. Um, in at the end of January in, in the UK, when patients were coming off the plane, it was almost seen as an exotic sort of non-entity, which were, it was almost seen as the, the the equivalent of Ebola, which we, we thought it just, it, it, you do get suspected Ebola patients coming into the UK, but the, the generally, vast majority of them will, will just be false false uh, false alarms. Sure. Um, yeah. So we, we thought this, this thing was a, a massive false alarm, but as February progressed and we started to see more patients and then started to get some positive tests back, then our own colleagues started to become unwell. It, it was really obvious to us what was going wrong. And I, I was one of the first doctors to actually go public. I did a, an interview in The Guardian um, in early March 2020, for which I got in a lot of trouble for, um, but which directly affected government policy. And it accelerated the speed and urgency for which things were addressed in Parliament. Um, and lockdown happened March 23rd, 2020. I think without some of those initial catalysts and, and interventions, I'm not claiming credit for, 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 for that. It was certainly part of a, uh, a, a group of people who were raising concerns. If we hadn't done that and we delayed lockdown even a few more days, I, I shudder to think what would have happened. And then, uh, I, yes, lots of other things happened. My wife was pregnant at the time. She was a, she's a doctor and she was dismayed at the situation about PPE um, and how P the government was treating pregnant doctors like such as herself. There was no protocol saying, well, if, if you're a pregnant doctor, I mean, should you be working in this environment at all? Um, and there was just a lot of really poor management, really poor abdication of decision making just saying, oh, this is the policy, so we have to follow it, without using common sense um, and without listening to doctors on the front line who are, we, we were the ones who were putting ourselves at risk. We were the sitting ducks and over a thousand of my colleagues died um, as a result of the intransigence of our decision makers. So my, my wife protested in, in early April 2020 in front of Downing Street and then she became the, while I was, a, I had, I enjoyed perhaps faux celebrity for a few weeks. And while well, I, I, I was probably the equivalent of, of being on the cover of Nuts magazine, and uh, she got on the cover of Vogue magazine, actually. So, yeah, and then we raised a, a legal case against the government for, um, for uh, our case against PPE and, and anti-racism within the NHS as well. And all of those things have, culminated into both myself and my wife becoming sort of avid campaigners for justice in all forms. Indeed, indeed. So comprehensive. We'll have a slight return to some of that later on for now. Um, you know, we'll go there now. Have there been any developments in your ongoing protest against the irregular goings on in your job as a doctor that perhaps could be voiced here? Feel free to go into as much detail as the subject deserves. I mean, our legal case against the government closed uh, a while ago, and I think the focus has gone from gone away from my job and from from my wife's job, and actually trying to focus those who still need our help. Um, so we're still trying to get justice for a few doctors who have been wronged over the past few years as well. Um, so we're working on on their campaigns and and trying to give them some support as, as well, um, and trying to help the families of 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 doctors and nurses who have passed away as well. Um, it's it's just a, a really tragic time to, to see that our colleagues who dedicated their, their lives to the NHS have, have passed away because of bad decisions, sure. to which nobody's sure. only up for. What kind of support are you trying to afford them? Well, we've helped with quite a few crowdfunders and sadly, a lot of my last year has been spent trying to help crowdfunders for funerals of, of NHS staff and trying to provide a, a sort of uh, pastoral ear as well um, and just trying to speak 
as a doctor who isn't speaking in a sort of corporate capacity either. Um, there's been a lot of people who've been very dismayed at the actions of, of uh, um, there's been a lot of people who've been wronged by the system. I feel that there's mixed messaging going on from the government. On the one hand, they're saying, get back to work, lessons have been learned. And at the same time, there are slight, there seems to be an inconsistency there in that they do have the need to occasionally remind you that masks have to be worn and whatnot via, you know, uh, your, your interface on your transport, having like the tunnel, having, having that kind of messaging going out. So I feel like we're in two different worlds. Um, and at the same time, what you're doing now, just speaking to you about all the things that you're trying to do for these people, it seems to be gaslit um, quite a bit. We spoke about that. Um, in another video. Do you have anything to say about those, that paradox that we seem to be living in? Yeah, I think that's a really good point, John. Uh, I think there's definitely that aspect of the government trying to gaslight us and, and have some sort of plausible deniability come the inquiry. That's really their strategy. They don't want to get sued. They don't want to have any liability. They don't want to get sacked. So they're being really careful with, with their words and kind of hedging their bets at all times and saying, just like they are right now. I mean, we saw a preliminary report come out uh, just a few days ago from uh, the House of Commons Select Committee on Health. And in that, they said that it was the most catastrophic public health failure that there'd been in our, in our lifetimes, which to be fair, we already knew. But it, having it from, for example, Jeremy Hunt, who is an ex-health secretary, yes. uh, was, was quite significant. Um, but even now, the government are saying, well, it's all easy with hindsight, which is why I looked through Twitter the other day and, and actually looked at a thread and just had, to, I was looking at, for example, the Sky News post, which is saying a, a letter written by hundreds of, of, of scientists has warned against the government's approach to this COVID pandemic, again, early March, 2020. So there's no way that you can say it with hindsight. It's just, there's a lot of, of media whitewashing. And mm. um, for me, it's always gonna stay sort of crystal clear the memories of what it was like to be in those COVID wards as a doctor and then being on the outside as well and being told for example that those of us who were falling ill my colleagues who did fall ill um we were being told that it was because they were going to Tesco and catching it catching COVID in Tesco so I, I, and I won't forget that and actually it's that sort of anger which has really got me going to to a kind of uh, um, a very very aggressive direction with with my music because sure. I know I, I, I can I can only write so many letters to managers um, but I, I want Kill the Icon to have some cultural re relevance some some cultural crossover um, and say well if people are actually singing singing our songs about the letters that I've been writing to our leaders then you might actually get some some change I think change can happen two ways. I think it can happen direct action, but there also needs to be some sort of soft power happening through cultural relevance. I really never underestimated just how important that soft power is. Um, I think if you can get people singing about things, that's when you know that that uh, that people really care about something. Um, and I think people care about it. They might might just not know about the nitty gritty of things. Yeah, I think um, several nails hit on the head there, especially with, if you look at, say, 2011 or so, you have what Occupy were doing, um, and that does actually open up the conversation for people to consider capitalism as being like a major ill, that it's, it's not even like particularly transgressive to think of it in those terms. What the pandemic has shown us is that these elite um, uh, co-opting uh, situations, whether it be like the media being less investigated than it ought to be, or the government trying to gaslight your particular situation, it, it again shows us another level of understanding as to what's really going on. So there's, there's a lot of potential for coalition there, um, and that obviously will take form in uh, libidinal activities such as music. So yeah, it's, it's definitely a, um, a, a very opportune time for Kill the Icon to occur, I guess. Um, I have another question. Um, this is more about the aesthetics of, let's say, a, your, your political band, yeah? Um, have you considered using projections of political events during your performance, 
or would that offend your sensibilities? Would that be too on the nose? Uh, I think we're definitely keen on having some sort of projections. It is something that I try to look into. I think logistically, it is pretty tough to arrange. So if anybody knows an easy way that we can arrange that sort of thing, then I would be very keen on, on, on exploring that idea for sure, for sure. I mean, we open our, uh, I mean, we open up our escape with, with an audio file, actually, an audio intro of um, uh, an American talk show from about 30 years ago where they were discussing, um, it, it was with Jello Biafra, who's a lead singer of the Dead Kennedys. And they're talking with, with an ultra conservative lady about, about censorship um, and the idea of, of whether songs can be kind of harmful to, to children. Um, so that, that, was, that was the sort of direction that we wanted people to, we wanted people to be in that headspace when, when we played that opening riff. Sure, sure. There is um, a fantastic photographer, friend of mine, Steve Gullick, who um, took a lot of amazing pictures of the prodigy and Nirvana back in the day. He does music videos now, um, and he specializes, in my opinion, in projection. So I will put you in touch with him. Um, and I could have said that off camera, but I'll give him a shout out because he's amazing. Yeah, why not? <laughs> everybody needs a shout out. Cool. Um, next question. Um, well, Actually, it's the final question. What forms of protest music have inspired you in the past? And do you ever have any anxiety in approaching what some consider to be a marmite form of entertainment? Well, I think it kind of goes back to what I was saying before. Is that I, I want people to love the rips and then understand what, what we're singing about. I think that's when, when a song really kind of transcends the culture and says, well, actually, you know, these people were saying something which is quite important. Um, and like you said about one... Uh, in, in one of our previous chats about having that lyric, uh, uh, do you want to die a martyr or have your face on a, on a $20 bill? Um, it's that sort of thing. I want something to stick with the person. I d to start off with, it's going to be the riff because it's immediate. For all of our songs, it's very, very deliberate that the, that the riff will start things off and the riff is the thing that will give you the hook. But it's the lyrics which hopefully might stick with people. Um, but in, in terms of influences, I, I think definitely Dead Kennedys and what they were doing and sort of in something like Holiday in Cambodia, it was, it's a very, very um, nice reference point for even just for me to say, look, this ground has been approached before and, yeah. and, and been very, very popular during a time of political upheaval. Um, so I, I, I think that I, I, I certainly think I'm more prepared to sing about political stuff now than I would have been five years ago. My understanding of it is is much much deeper, um, and hopefully, hopefully the songs will will kind of resonate with people in that way as well. Sure, sure. Once again, um, we have run out of time, and we've used I think our time quite well. Um, I would like though for this to be a moment where you use it as a platform to sell your music. Where can people go to buy Kill the Icon? So you can buy a HEPA filter from killtheicon.com uh, for £8,000 a piece. If you can't afford that, then we do have something which is pretty free of charge. So uh, you can uh, go, you can search for Kill the Icon on Spotify. Um, our debut single, Buddhist Monk, comes out on 19th of November. Um, if you're listening to this before 19th of November, you can go on our Facebook page, kill the icon, and you can uh, click on our pre-save link so you can get it straight, straight in your release radar, your inbox, and uh, whatever Spotify does to, to give artists about 0.005 pence <laughs> per stream. So yeah, I'm desperate for that 0.005 pence. Indeed. Um, would it be on Bandcamp as well to give you more than 0.005 pence? Yes, so we, we will be doing Bandcamp as well, yeah. Awesome, that's good to know. Thank you so much for your time. I think my Jeremy paxman liked questions have fried both our brains. It's time for us to retire to our real lives. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks Thank as so always, much. John. Appreciate it, brother. Thank you. Thank you. That's okay. To be continued. Bye-bye.